Boldwood presents Old Friends Reunited, written by Maddie Please and read by Penelope Freeman. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One I need a break. The thought came to me in a flash, just as a blackbird cannoned into the French windows and stood looking dazed on the wet grass outside my garden office. I wrote garden office when what I should have said was renovated shed. It had been converted into a place where I could write in peace and concentrate and not tidy the cutlery drawer or be distracted by a pile of ironing, especially when it was cold like that day. I need a holiday, I said it out loud that time. Actually saying it and using the magical word holiday seemed to make it an even more attractive and achievable prospect. I pulled on some fingerless mittens which had arrived that morning from Amazon in the hope they would keep my hands warm enough to type. My circulation wasn't what it used to be in those days. The same went for my hearing. I hadn't had a proper, enjoyable, restful break from my routine for a very long time. Not since my ex-husband dropped his bombshell and left. And let's be honest, that had been over four years ago. I was coping. I could manage. But surely I should have moved on far further with my life than I had. The occasional weekend visiting my daughters didn't really have the same reviving effect. Libby and her husband Simon were a hundred miles away, and their preferred way of spending a weekend was a DIY project, which invariably led to an argument. Katie and her boyfriend were closer but lived in a state of near chaos. There were always towering laundry piles. Mum, if Callum wants an iron shirt, he can do it himself. Squabbles about the TV remote, and occasionally requests for money. Not that I minded any of that. I was always happy to help if I could. But I just wanted to get away. By myself. Give myself time to think at last. Properly get away from here. From my computer. From my new agent. Chasing me on a regular basis about the failed deadline for my next book. From my pathetic daily word count. From my editor begging me for a follow-up Christmas book. But make it absolutely crazy and hilarious from that awful wet spring and disappointing summer, and from blackbirds banging into the windows. I needed to do something different. A few minutes later, I opened up an email from Audrey, and it was like a sign. One of those strange coincidences, like when you wonder, head slumped on your hand, if it is possible to buy a comfortable bra anywhere, and suddenly, Facebook is full of adverts for them. By the way, it's not possible. Every woman who actually needs a bra knows that. Subject Baggy's Reunion Dear B, Hello, fellow Baggy. Come and visit. I could do with some moral support. I know you must be so busy. Every time I go into a bookshop, there seems to be another new book you've written. How do you do it? Don't you ever take a break from it? It's ages since you were here. You'd be amazed how much it's changed. The Gites are free from the 25th. We are having a big wedding here the week before, so the house will probably be in chaos. I wish you would come and stay. Jean is coming over to visit in October. The other found a member of the bag gang, B, Audrey, and Jean. We thought we were so clever, didn't we? But we really are old bags now, aren't we? How long ago that seems. Jean's stayed here in the Gite several times, but I don't think your paths have crossed. She's been through another nasty-sounding divorce, and she sounds full of angst. She really did think it would be fourth time lucky. Obviously not. At least this marriage lasted longer than the others. I think we could do with you to spread some cheer over us both. 
Get in touch. It would be such fun. Audrey. Kiss kiss. Was I in the mood to spread cheer? Admittedly, that had always been my role when we were at school. The class joker, the one who came up with the ideas, got caught and took the blame. At that moment, though, I wasn't sure if I was up to the task. I was the one who needed cheering up for a change. Even clowns have their dark days. I rummaged in the bottom drawer of my desk to find the school photo. Yes, there was Jin standing at the back, a head taller than everyone else. A huge grin was plastered over her face, her wild red hair escaping from its ponytail, as rebellious as she was. There was Audrey, tiny, pretty, and the one who got away with everything, slumped cross-legged in the front, scowling at the camera, probably because double art had been cancelled. And there I was, placed safely next to a teacher to stop me from doing what I had done last time the school photograph was taken, run around the back of the group when the camera started, so I could be photographed twice. Audrey and Jin had been my best friends since boarding school days. Audrey had been to visit me in Herefordshire several times over the years, getting away from all the dust and builders and officialdom at her home. Jin had been to visit too, when she'd been between husbands, needing a breather from her complicated relationships. Funny how some friends stay around for years and others don't. St. Martha's hadn't been a big school, but looking through a magnifying glass at the long cardboard coil of the school photo that evening, there were dozens of girls whom I had absolutely no recollection of. A few were memorable for the wrong reasons, for smoking, boy trouble and growing pot. Honestly, matron, they are just tomato plants. A couple were mega swats that everyone despised. Not now, obviously, because they were both running huge corporations and being smug in Seattle and Canary Wharf. And one had surely gone to prison. Arson is a terrible way to get one's kicks. I focused in on the teacher sitting next to me. Grim, grey-haired, humorless. Beatrice Pinkerton, are you chewing gum? No, Miss Harvey. Are you lying? Possibly, Miss Harvey. Then spit it out. No, and not onto my shoes. How young we were. How bored we all looked. How thin. When was the last time I'd been to stay with Audrey? It must have been three years ago, long after William and I had gone our separate ways. If I was honest, our divorce hadn't been unexpected. I suppose deep down I'd always known that William couldn't be trusted when it came to working late, business conferences and trips away. With the benefit of hindsight, which is always so much clearer than it is useful, I could see I had made a lot of mistakes putting up with it. Still, good judgment came from experience, and I suppose experience came from poor judgment. I alone had dealt with the fallout of William clearing out our bank account, and a considerable sum from his employers too, and leaving the country with a girl young enough to be his daughter. His furious colleagues, the police, the tabloids lurking behind the bushes, the endless paperwork and the phone calls, not to mention our daughter's disbelief and anger. Audrey and Victor had been wonderful to me. They were kind, thoughtful and encouraging as I faced the future alone. I kept going. I didn't allow myself to think too much. At the time, I was just numb, and I didn't remember much about it now, only that I had needed to stay positive. To pretend everything was okay when it so obviously wasn't. What fools we can be sometimes, I thought, pretending even to the people closest to us, the ones who love us, that we are capable and strong, when the truth is so different. Jin had been married and divorced four times, still finding the energy to establish and run a recruitment company that was eventually sold for what she described as a pleasing amount to a competitor. Most of my pictures of her seemed to be from her various weddings, apart from the one in Las Vegas. She was certainly resilient, I had to admit. She seemed to have found stability with Mel, the fourth one, but apparently not. 
During my last visit to Audrey's place, she had still been in the middle of renovations that seemed to go on forever, but her builders had been taking a break for August. Les Grandes Vacances, they called it, when lots of things in France seemed to come to a stop. The television crew had been around on and off for years, and the week before I arrived they had been filming Audrey's husband unwisely taking a sledgehammer to an old barn. Their son, Mateus, had been there too for once, lured by the irresistible appeal of television cameras and some pretty blonde assistant. He'd been standing around smoking, looking cool and offering advice. From what Audrey had told me, it was the most he ever did. The renovations of Chateau de Saint-Cyr had taken nearly ten years, and every painstaking detail had been filmed and discussed. The Chateau of Dreams TV show had been a sensation, and they had become minor celebrities for a while. There had even been a couple of coffee table books with glossy, gorgeous photographs inside, a Facebook page with thousands of members, and an Instagram account with followers in the hundreds of thousands. People had loved watching Audrey and her outrageous colleague Gaston, who was famed for his interior design skills and his tantrums, shopping for vintage china and furniture in the flea markets of Aix, deliberating over glass vases, buying flowers and bolts of antique fabric. Audrey, a clipboard in her hand, overseeing the workmen as they replaced the wiring and the plumbing, always with a smile on her face, apparently unfazed by anything. Even her arguments with the French officials, her hair and clothes, chic and immaculate. The trademark closing shot of Audrey holding a glass of their famous and prize-winning souffle de Saint-Cyr, giving a cheeky wink to the camera, had been inspired. Sales of their rosé wine had rocketed. Admittedly, there weren't many similar images of Victor, because he'd been away earning the money to pay for the building's transformation. But occasionally he'd been there too, smiling and admiring his clever wife's handiwork and determination. I closed my eyes for a moment and tried to remember the heat, the rich Provencal sunshine beating down on the stone pergola, the warm air faintly scented with rosemary and garlic. There would be a small, convenient table with a mosaic top by the side of my chair, and just within reach, a bottle of their famous sparkling souffle de Saint-Cyr in an ice bucket. Peace and quiet apart from the twittering of a few small French birds in the trees and the occasional engaging conversation of my friends. It would be the chance to catch up on their news, have some amusing and entertaining discussion which had nothing to do with resurrecting my finances or with my word count, deadlines, structural edits, or William. Time to think. Perhaps I had been coping, been strong for long enough. Audrey and Jin would commiserate with me over my publishing dilemmas, perhaps offer some advice or tell me how much they had enjoyed my last book. We could cook together in Audrey's vast kitchen with its huge Lacanche range cooker. I could imagine nights sleeping peacefully, my dreams unclouded by my continuing inability to put one decent sentence in front of another to remember myself as I used to be when I wasn't just a bit part in other people's lives. I hadn't met up with Jin for years. The last time I'd been to stay with her and her then-husband Mel in their holiday cottage by the sea, which was so far from being a cottage that the American version of the Trade Descriptions Act must have been seriously breached. They'd been celebrating a wedding anniversary, something that was unusual for Jin. Indeed, she had made a joke that one of her four marriages hadn't lasted long enough for the ink to dry on the paperwork. Jin would bring her usual brand of crazy positivity, her loud American optimism, which had been so uplifting during those interminable school days of timetables, hockey on a muddy field, and detentions. Yes, that was exactly what I needed. A break, and some sympathetic encouragement and some plain, old-fashioned fun. I would come home refreshed, my batteries recharged, and I'd be back to my old self in no time, 
producing books just as I had done for nearly thirty years. Maybe I would even summon up the energy to get to grips with my new agent, Vesta. I'd been with Vesta's predecessor for thirty-one years. Layla had found me my first publishing contract, and we had understood each other. Many years ago, Layla had got a couple of my books optioned for films, which had produced a very nice sum. But there had been nothing like it since then. Layla had been supportive, fending off irritated publishers when I was going through the divorce and all the investigations. It was obvious Vesta didn't work like that. Thinking about her now, I shivered with panic. Perhaps I had used up all my ideas. Perhaps I was too old to be current. I was just over sixty. How was that even possible? I didn't feel sixty inside my head. I'd had a new professional photo for my author profile taken, with proper makeup and hair done by experts, wearing an expensive dress and using flattering lighting. Not a casual snap of me laughing on a beach. I'd sold millions of books all around the world, but I couldn't compete with all the gorgeous young things who were attracting the media's attention these days. I would never be on Loose Women answering embarrassing questions about my drug habit or my celebrity boyfriend. I felt another chill of panic run up my spine. I had to do something about this. There was absolutely no way I was ready to give up on my career or on myself. Apart from anything else, I couldn't afford to. Only now, after four years, was I beginning to see real progress with my finances. I'd been a writer for most of my adult life, apart from a stint teaching English at the local secondary school when the girls were small. I didn't think I could cope with that again, even if someone would employ me. No matter. How good I was! Being sixty wasn't cool. The head teacher of the local comprehensive had just recently been on the local news. She looked about twenty-five and had pink hair. But if I wasn't a writer, what was I? In my head, I was firming up on things. I needed, indeed, I deserved a holiday, a break, a sabbatical, and come hell or high water, I was going to have one. I just needed to find a way to tell Vesta. I was already eight months late sending her. You left me behind, and she was getting very spiky. Layla would have understood the sort of pressure I'd been under. Perhaps I would post Vesta a letter to tell her at the airport just before I got on the plane. In the end, I plucked up the courage to see Vesta and tell her that I needed some time out. She was thin-lipped. Exasperated, and almost angry, I reassured her I would still be working. Though inwardly I clung to the idea of a clean break. She didn't sound convinced, but to start with, we had a reasonably civil discussion while she tapped the end of her pen on the desk in front of her. Okay, if you need a break, then I can't really stop you. But we can't go on like this, B. I know you and Layla worked well together for so many years. You were a powerhouse, and you have a fantastic track record. But the publishing industry has changed. You must realise that. Well, I'm past being a surgically enhanced celebrity, I said rather tartly. She clicked her tongue at me. Don't be daft. It has nothing to do with looks or your age, B. You have a great following. People buy your books, and they want the next one. I bloody want the next one. I wanted it for a long time, and you seem no closer to finishing it than you were when I took over. I didn't meet her eye. I'm nearly there with it, she sighed. So you've sorted out the original synopsis like we discussed, and now you've finished the first draft. I made an evasive sort of noise that said, "Yes, but also no." Just about. It felt like being back in the headmistress's office for another telling off, and heaven knows I'd had enough of those in my time. And it wasn't strictly true. I had about seventy thousand words done, and the rest scribbled on post-it notes and in various notebooks. 
I still needed another ten or fifteen thousand words from somewhere, and then time to edit out all the plot holes and bad grammar. I'd get there eventually. I just needed inspiration and time. Perhaps this holiday would give me the chance to do that. She sighed. What is the matter, B? There's obviously something that's not been right for a while. I know you've been through a difficult patch. I'm trying to understand. I want to help. But I can't if you don't reply to my emails. I clenched my fists under the table. But this is the way it is at the moment, I wanted to say. I know it's been ages since it all happened. On paper, I dealt with it. In my head, things were still very muddled. Didn't I deserve a break? I'd done well for the Pest and Vance Agency. I'd made them a lot of money over the years. I'd adapted and changed. I'd listened to their advice. During the course of my career, my main characters had aged from bright twenty-somethings who were looking for love in their first home into thirty-somethings who were wrestling with jobs and partners and occasionally children. My last three books had been about some forty-something friends coping with divorce and empty nests. My books sold in huge numbers. People enjoyed them. So up till now I'd done pretty well. People didn't realise it, but all those books, dismissed as easy to read, took a disproportionate amount of time to construct. But now there was more to not being able to finish this book. I could feel it. It wasn't just my procrastination, my addiction to social media and wasting hours on Amazon looking for kitchen gadgets. Why I suddenly felt the need to make bread or change the sheets rather than sort out my latest plot. I hadn't been able to get my head around anything properly for some time. Sometimes it felt as though my brain were fogged. Could I still blame William? All those women? All those lies? Perhaps it was my age. Was that a reasonable excuse? It was a poor one. I was in excellent health, far better than I deserved, considering my largely sedentary lifestyle and unpredictable eating habits. I couldn't remember the last time I had cooked a proper meal for myself. Baked potatoes or something on toast seemed to be my staples. And biscuits. Anyway, I had worked out a plan and I told Vesta all the details. I was going away for a month, possibly more if I could get around her. She could hardly follow me to the south of France and haul me back. Although looking at her gimlet eyes and determined expression, I wouldn't have put it past her. Normally, I didn't like making long-term plans because I never really knew how I would feel when the time came to carry them out. Actually, the same was true for short-term plans, if I was honest. But this felt very different. At last, I was going to see Audrey and Jin again. Audrey had promised she would leave me to my work. I knew I would find many quiet corners where I could write, imagining the delicious view over the countryside. The words would flow from my fingers in a silver stream. I would be reinvigorated, restored. I would find my way back to that magical place where everything came together and worked. As I spoke... I was losing sight of the idea of a proper holiday, my original reason for the trip fading, and some sort of compromise materialising. There was a moment's very deep silence while Vesta looked at the backs of her hands and I looked out of the plate glass windows at the London skyline. A scruffy looking pigeon on the windowsill watched us both. Right, she said at last. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, but you have to see it from my perspective. You aren't being fair to either of us. I know you and Layla were together for such a long time, and I know you had your own way of working. Yes, sometimes you missed deadlines, but she managed to cover for you. But as I keep telling you, things have changed. Things are changing here at Peston Vance too. 
I need to work with people I can trust to deliver the goods and deliver them on time. I didn't like the sound of this at all. I've spoken with the boss about this. I didn't like the sound of that either. Bernard Peston Vance was my friend. At least I thought he was. Over the years we'd been to events and conferences and parties together. He'd given me framed awards for sales figures, and I'd received handwritten Christmas cards from him, not printed ones from the office. I was on the front page of their website, and had been for years. Bernard agrees with me. We need to find a way through this. Your method of working just doesn't fly these days. It's not professional. If a publisher asks for a book in January, they want it in January, not when you get round to it. You Left Me Behind is already eight months late. Keep the Faith was a year behind schedule. It sold a lot of copies, I said. Yes, because you're a great writer when you get around to it. You were supposed to be speaking at the conference in July last year, and you were late for that too. Layla may have been happy to cover for you, but, well, I can't. I watched the pigeon outside. It looked worried and cold. I felt much the same way. I can work with Bernard then, I said rather defiantly. Bernard is retiring, Vesta flashed back. He's announcing it next week. Retiring? Bernard? Bernard Peston Vance had started this agency. I'd been one of his first clients. He was irreplaceable. He was a gentleman. He even wore suits at the weekends, and he called his wife and every other woman who crossed his path, darling. And strictly between these four walls, I'm taking over from him, Vesta concluded. As I said, Things are going to change. My quiver of unease turned into a cold shudder. Don't worry. This month, six weeks away, we'll see the book finished, I said firmly. Absolutely, definitely. I don't think I was fooling either of us. Vesta pulled a face, her head on one side, and slid a letter across the desk towards me. The envelope was embossed with the familiar BPV logo. If you are not back here with a completed first draft by the end of the year, Vesta said, I'm afraid we will have to part company. This was ridiculous. It couldn't be happening. Not so long ago, other agents had been cozying up to me trying to lure me away from BPV. There really is no need for this, Vesta. I hope not, B. Have your holiday, take a break, but don't forget about the work. Of course not, I said firmly. Chapter Two Even with that hanging over me, I put all the difficult stuff to the back of my mind, because I'd become really good at doing that, and firmed up my plans. I'd forgotten how it felt. There were few things better than setting out on a holiday. When I was younger, I'd always prided myself on being able to successfully pack in 15 minutes. But if I'm honest, I've messed this up many times since. So the ten days before I left were filled with anticipation, preparations, counting the knickers I'd packed in my case twice, that never-to-be-forgotten cruise when I only took one spare pair still made me cringe, and checking I had my passport, travel documents, and the tourist guides I'd bought and poured over. I had packed with clothes suitable for a warm autumn holiday in the south of France, and of course I had a few urgently requested gifts for Audrey, a large jar of Marmite, shortbread, and some of her favourite lemon-scented soap. I had a tiny travel clock from the Buckingham Palace website that Jin might like. What do you buy for someone who was married to a millionaire orthodontist anyway? Or rather, someone who used to be. That evening, I fetched an old photo album from the attic and opened it up. There I was, on a school trip to Warwick Castle, lying on the grass when I should have been filling in a questionnaire about John of Gaunt. I looked bright-eyed, optimistic, 
full of mischief. Had I really been that scrawny? I hadn't realised. Why didn't I appreciate it at the time? Mary Helvin and Jean Shrimpton had been my idols, and no thirteen-year-old girl with a passion for crunchies could ever live up to them. V undoubtedly has enthusiasm, but is easily led. She is interested in making up stories, but the improvement in her handwriting has highlighted her poor grammar. That phrase from one of my school reports had followed me down the years. My father had even quoted it in his speech when I married William. There was Jin, triumphantly raising a bottle of woodpecker cider above her head. Heaven knows where she got that. There was Audrey, cross-legged, legs like toothpicks, squinting against the sun, cigarette in hand. I sat in my window seat, my new notebook open on my lap, ready to jot down ideas I could use in my work, and looked down at the French countryside laid out far below, sometimes hidden under hazy French clouds. I had a lovely feeling of anticipation of childish adventure, though let's be honest, I was far from a child. The light was always different in France, and so was the air, and I'd always liked how every place around the world had its own particular smell. To me, America was hot and humid with the promise of nearby doughnuts. Australia was warmth and eucalyptus and sizzling white sand. Italy was roasting coffee, basil and vanilla. The south of France was cheese, freshly baked bread and lavender fields. It was irresistible. I began to feel quite perky. I never seemed to feel glum or worried when I went to France. The people I'd met there had always been friendly. They responded with kindness to my schoolgirl French, and they were interested in where I was going and why. This was what I needed, to be treated like a person in my own right, not just a mum who wasn't needed much any more, not just a failed wife, not just a producer of hilarious feel-good uplit. I was looking forward to this trip enormously. I could almost taste it. I could imagine sitting overlooking the glorious landscape. I'd been on Google Earth several times. Isn't technology amazing? Under a parasol, writing and thinking about my book, the long, golden light would stretch over their vineyard, the lovely walls of the chateau reaching up into the clear sky, a couple of their hens scratching about in the gravel, perhaps Audrey's cheerful French husband Victor would be mowing the grass with his red tractor mower, his battered canvas cap on his head. I smiled at the thought. I couldn't wait to see them. I felt as though I were travelling to a little oasis of calm inside the continuing uncertainty of my life. No one could be miserable with them around. Audrey and Victor were the happiest, most loving couple I knew, with an enviable lifestyle in their wonderful chateau now that the building work was finished. I was anticipating a lot of lazy evenings, relaxing by their pool, a glass of wine in one hand, my new chapters positively zinging with inspiration as the three of us talked and laughed together. Long lunches under the sun-flecked pergola, perhaps a game of tennis with gin making up the four as the evening cooled. I made a little excited noise, thrilled at the prospect. I felt like telling someone the steward, perhaps, or the sleeping teenage girl next to me, that I was friends with the people who had been on that television show, that I was setting out on an unexpected adventure, one that was going to make all the difference. The journey from the airport went smoothly enough. It was only an hour's drive, after all, and I had driven in France quite a bit over the years. But I needed all my wits about me that day, as I followed the streams of traffic down the A55 through scrubby, rock-strewn landscapes under graffitied bridges and terrifying tunnels. The weather was grey and uninspiring, which was disappointing, but the trees were starting to show the first flashes of autumn colour. The sky above was heavy with rain clouds, sweeping in from the Mediterranean, but that didn't matter either. I was saying yes for a change 
I was doing something out of character, and it felt marvellous. Why had I waited so long? Perhaps adventures and spur-of-the-moment decisions were not just for young people. My route took me past villages and towns, through a myriad of roundabouts, until I was spun off onto the wonderfully named road La Bourrasque, leading south to the coast. It couldn't be far. I focused on the road and not on the stunning scenery unfurling ahead of me. I took some deep, calming breaths. I had done this journey a few times before, but William had always been the one driving and I didn't really remember it. Perhaps there were some new roads. Other people could do this. I could do this. I had plenty of fuel. The hire car wasn't making any strange noises. I'd slowed down for roadworks and toll booths. I'd managed everything. And as the journey progressed, I began to relax. The route I needed to follow was signed to Toulon and Aubin. The other direction led to incredibly exciting places. Nice, Cannes, Fréjoux saint Raphael. I could almost smell the ombre solaire, imagine the oligarch's yachts on the sparkling sea. My heart was thudding with excitement. I might be in my sixties now, I might have grey hair and age spots on my hands, but sod it. I was doing something different, I was challenging myself, and I really was having a bit of fun for a change. In front of me, a craggy rock face reared up. Behind it, another, shrouded in thick cloud. The road plunged down to the coast and along the side of an endless beach. Cafes, palm trees in the middle of roundabouts, and the wind whipping up white waves far out to sea. French people, motorhomes with strange number plates, pastel-painted houses with red-tiled roofs, the sea shaded from teal to dark cobalt blue. And then suddenly, I saw a marina. There were boats of all sizes, moored behind a breakwater, bobbing and dipping in the wind. It was breathtaking. I pulled over into a car park and got out, shivering at the unexpected chill. It wasn't far now, but I needed a rest. I realised my hands had been braced to the steering wheel, so I massaged some life back into them. That would be nice, I thought turning up with hands like a couple of claws. I wanted to find a loo, but I didn't dare wander off in case I got lost or someone clamped the car. There was a large notice board telling me things I wasn't allowed to do, and my French wasn't really up to deciphering it. But according to the pictures, there were trip hazards, there was the possibility of my car landing upside down in the water, and potentially people falling off bicycles. There was also a notice about dogs which was so confusing that I wasn't sure if they were prohibited or compulsory. As I got back into the car, a few spots of rain clattered against the windscreen. I turned back to the road and followed the route inland again. I passed through the high ironwork gates of the Chateau de Saint-Cyr just after four o'clock. By then it was cold and there was a hard wind blowing. Well, that hadn't been in the plan at all. What had happened to all that sunshine and warmth I'd been expecting? The first thing I saw was Audrey stamping up the drive towards me, a small, clenched little figure in a voluminous red raincoat, her hair plastered in rat's tails around her face. Something definitely wasn't right. She wasn't coming to greet me at the gates with a wide smile and a hug as I had anticipated. In fact, I don't think she even realised it was me, until I stopped my car and wound down the window. Audrey, it's me, I called out. She stopped and looked a bit blank. Her expression wasn't one of delighted anticipation. She looked as though she was in an absolutely filthy temper, and as though she'd been crying. It's me, it's B, I said again. Her face cleared, and she rubbed one hand over it, wiping her eyes. Zoot! Oh, yes, of course, I've forgotten. Hello, B. Forgotten? Had I got it wrong? Was I too early? 
but I'd emailed her to confirm my travel plans ages ago, and she had emailed back to say that would be marvellous. We'd had several phone calls to discuss where I would stay. She'd been excited. She'd been looking forward to it. I'd spoken to her the previous evening, for heaven's sake. We didn't say anything for a few seconds, me sitting in the car and Audrey standing in the cold, shivering. Get in, you're soaking, I said at last. Has it been raining? I added, awkwardly making small talk, though I already knew the answer. She tutted at me and rolled her eyes. No, I just threw a bucket of water over myself. Of course it's been raining. Audrey scurried around to the passenger side of the car. She got in with a grunt as she flopped into the seat. Zut, sorry. I hadn't forgotten you were coming, B. Of course I hadn't. It's just... She gulped a bit and fished in the pocket of her raincoat, pulling out a tissue, which she used to dry her face. She pulled down the sun visor and checked her appearance in the mirror. Mon Dieu, there's mascara everywhere. I look a ruin. Alors, just pull up there, at the side of the house. We can use the kitchen door. I drove slowly up towards the chateau, which was sitting sullen and dark, the sky grey and bruised above it. The rain started again, suddenly, spitefully lashing down on the windscreen. None of this fitted with my unrealistic anticipation of how this might have gone. It was rather disappointing, and also very worrying. Are you okay? I said as I turned off the ignition. Stupid question, she obviously wasn't. No, not really. I'm giving you a terrible welcome, aren't I? Désolé. There's no need to apologise, I can see you're upset. I reached across to give her a hug. Inside her voluminous coat there was some ominous scrabbling and growling noises, and suddenly a small dog appeared from underneath and clamped its jaws onto my sleeve. Bijou, non? Sois pas méchante, Audrey said, tapping the dog on its nose. It looked at me and bared its teeth. Sorry, B. She's upset too. Look, let's get inside, Cherry. I checked my cuff for tooth marks, collected my bags from the boot and followed her into the house, rain dripping unpleasantly down the neck of my jacket. We went into the kitchen, which was a huge, glorious room, windows all along one side, which would give light and provide a gorgeous view of the garden when it wasn't raining quite so hard. There was a delicious scent of tomatoes and garlic and thyme. Audrey dropped the dog onto a chair and turned and swept me up into a huge hug. The dog jumped down, circled my feet and sniffed suspiciously at my shoes. I'm so glad to see you. Really, I am. You can't imagine, she said. Her voice was a bit wobbly. We looked at each other for a few seconds. My friend, always a slender woman, was thinner than I had remembered, her hands bony and cold in mine, her hair once glossy black, then later scattered with grey, was now silver. Her eyes were tired, her skin, under what remained of her makeup, was sallow. She had always been the most attractive of us, the most confident, even at school. She seemed to wear even the horrible maroon school uniform with a certain flair. Her hair had always been well cut and as glossy as a starling's wing. She hadn't been plagued with spots or greasy skin or puppy fat like the rest of us. Out of her school uniform she had also been chic, even at thirteen. A cotton scarf would be tied around her neck with casual style, her skirts slightly too short over her slim legs. Other girls, me included, tried and failed to copy her. Oh, Audrey, what on earth is the matter? I said. What's happened? I whispered, as though we needed to keep this conversation quiet, although I always remembered the saint Cloud family as being one of the noisiest I had ever known. Coffee? Tea? How was your journey? She said. Neither, thanks, I replied, 
although I was gasping for some tea, I was far more worried about her. What's happened? Oh, you know, things, she said unhelpfully. Is Jin here yet? Tomorrow. She arrives tomorrow, Audrey said, her voice giving a sad little croak. That's good, isn't it? We will have an evening on our own. Absolutely, I said. Lots to catch up on. But what's the matter? I can see you're upset. Has something happened to Mateus? Audrey flapped her hand. No, nothing like that. The silly, selfish thoughts I had nurtured about this holiday were sliding away, leaving something very different in their place. The image of sunny uplands, of laughter and chatter around the pool, was fading fast. Instead, I could almost predict a lot of angst, bitterness, and the three of us getting drunk and maudlin over bottles of vintage souffle de Saint-Cyr. Perhaps it would be up to me to sort things out. I would have to dust off my class clown outfit. So what's going on? You're obviously unhappy, I said. Audrey made a sweeping gesture with one hand, almost knocking a vase of flowers off the worktop. I almost laughed, it was so dramatic. Pfft, she said in a very French way. I think I may need to ask Jean for some advice. She has been married four times, she knows how these things go. I blinked at her, not understanding. Victor and me. Je pense, uh, I think... We are going to divorce. No, no! And then I did laugh, and the dog barked, a high, sharp little yip as though it was my fault. It was ridiculous. It was unthinkable. They were happy. They had been married for nearly forty years. When Victor had decided to return to France fifteen years ago after winding up a law career working in London, Audrey had gone enthusiastically without any hesitation. But... I began. I am going to open a bottle of wine, Audrey said with a little choking sob. Under the circumstances, this sounded like a very good idea. Chapter 3 Thirty-four minutes later, after she'd opened a second bottle, we still hadn't moved from the kitchen, and I was bursting for a wee. That was my age, I supposed. I should have done those pelvic floor exercises when I was told. Audrey directed me to the loo in the nearby utility room, and I wandered off to find it. When I got back, she was still sitting there, the dog on her lap, both of them looking glum. By the way, where is Matthias? Audrey flicked me a dark look. Cambridge. He can't still be at university. It's been years, hasn't it? She made another noise. Four years for his degree, then a gap year, then a master's, two more gap years, random jobs which never came to anything, travelling, an attempt at a doctorate, some vague ideas of research. Who knows what he is doing now, she said. I sometimes think he is on a permanent gap year, but he's supposed to be coming home for a visit soon. I thought he was going to take over the vineyard here. Audrey drained her glass. That was the idea. Oh, I said. I sipped my rosé. It was lovely, but perhaps not a good idea on an empty stomach. It had been a long time since breakfast, and I'd only eaten a snack since then. I was feeling decidedly woozy, and Audrey was getting rather loud. How are the girls? I haven't seen much of them recently. They're both so busy. Katie's still with Callum, although no sign that they're going to get married. Perhaps I'm just old-fashioned. They're just back from a holiday in Crete. Libby and Simon are doing well. They've just moved to a dreadful old house near Taunton that Simon's going to redesign. I expect it will have glass walls and a floating staircase by the time he's finished with it. So what's that gorgeous smell, I said, hopefully, sniffing the air. Herbs, garlic, red wine. I was starving. Audrey looked 
around vaguely. I was making daub. I expect it will be ruined now. Well, it smells great, I said firmly. Daub was a traditional Provencal stew, hearty and delicious. It was exactly what I wanted. And doesn't it improve the longer you leave it? You always were a great cook. Audrey filled up her glass again, her mouth turned down in a dissatisfied arc. Great cook, great mother, although that's probably not true, seeing how my only son seems to be work-averse, famous project manager and decorator. Good housekeeper, just not a very good wife. After all this time, thirty-nine years we have been married, Thirty-nine years! Her voice rose to an indignant squeak. So where is Victor? She took a gulp of her wine. In Marseille, of course, at the office, working, avoiding me. We had a terrible row. He was supposed to be doing... He didn't help at all with the wedding. And they were such a sweet couple. He's back tomorrow. And I should be making the most of it by not complaining, not being a cow, une vache. That's what he called me, une vache difficile. She burst into noisy sobs and grabbed at a box of tissues. I went to put a comforting arm around her shoulders. The dog growled, and Audrey put a hand over its muzzle, which I thought was very considerate under the circumstances. Oh, Audrey, you're not a difficult cow. You've always been so devoted to each other. Audrey mopped up her tears and blew her nose. Ha! she said at last. I went to fill my empty wine glass with some chilled water from the front of the vast American-style fridge. I wondered if I'd packed some Gaviscon. Heartbone was definitely threatening, and the prospect of some rich, wine-heavy sauce on top of all that rosé was worrying, despite my empty stomach. You didn't have a dog the last time I was here, did you? I said. Audrey sank her face into the dog's feathery ears. This is Bijou. She's a papillon. She's a big dog in a small dog's body. She wants to apologize, don't you, Bijou, for being so rude earlier. She made the dog wave a paw at me. I waved back, and Bijou narrowed her eyes again. Perhaps I should get unpacked, and then you can show me around, I suggested. Of course, I'm being such a bad host. Audrey slipped off her chair and went to try and move my case, which was almost as big as she was. It's on wheels, Aud, leave it to me. We went back out of the kitchen door and across the patio, the wheels on my case trundling over the wet stone slabs to a grey door with a cute sign on the outside. L'ancienne littérie the old dairy. Bijou, obviously not keen on the weather, stayed at the kitchen door watching us. Here you are, Audrey said, just as you asked, although you could have come into the house, I wouldn't have minded. I've nearly got all the bedrooms back into some sort of order. The cleaners did a wonderful job. Still, I suppose it will be more peaceful here. You can come and go as you please and get on with your work. It's lovely, Aud, even nicer than I remember. Well, get settled and then come and have another drink. I'll be in the kitchen. Actually, I wasn't sure I needed another drink. I'd had more than enough already. Inside, there was the lovely sitting area I remembered from previous visits, decorated in pale blue and white, a spacious bedroom and beyond that a small wet room. It was perfect with so many thoughtful touches. Gorgeous soap in a paper wrapper, flowers on the dressing table, proper wooden coat hangers in the wardrobe, a basket of cookies next to the kettle in the kitchenette area. I could quite happily have shrugged off my shoes, made a cup of tea, and had a bit of a lie-down in the middle of the comfortable-looking bed. But that wasn't appropriate now. I needed to talk to Audrey, catch up on her news. Hopefully there was some other than the bombshell she had already delivered. What had happened? 
To my knowledge, Victor spent most of each week at his apartment in Marseille, running his huge and highly prosperous legal empire. He was so successful he was known by other lawyers as Victor Le Vainqueur, which sounded far more exotic than the English equivalent of Victor the Victor. Had he had an affair? Perhaps he had. I thought of all those chic little interns in leather miniskirts Audrey had mentioned over the years since their return to France. Or perhaps it was with an icy-eyed junior partner with her sights set on the boss. But surely not. Victor was a big, shambling bear of a man with a weakness for chocolate and gadgets, not the sort to chase other women when he was obviously so devoted to Audrey. Their relationship had been wonderful, inspiring, the sort of marriage that anyone would hope to be a part of. I unpacked my clothes, took a slug of Gaviscon straight from the bottle, and washed my hands and face with the new soap, which was lavender. That was better. I got back to the kitchen to find Audrey standing on a stepladder, a feather duster in one hand, stretching up towards the ceiling. I thought this wasn't perhaps the wisest thing to do with a bottle of sparkling rosé inside her. The stepladder wobbled alarmingly. What on earth are you doing? I said, hurrying over to hold it steady. Maudit araignée, she muttered. Look at those cobwebs. Victor is right, I am hopeless. Come down, I said, catching hold of her ankle. Let's have something to eat, shall we? I coaxed her down and hid the feather duster behind the bin. Of course, of course, you must be hungry. Audrey crashed about for a bit with saucepans and then eventually opened the back door, letting in a gust of rain and some cold air. Bijou retreated to her basket and watched disapprovingly. I need a cigarette, Audrey said, pulling a pack out from its hiding place in a stone jar. Do you mind? Still.